Okay, so uh, welcome to the afternoon session. And our first uh, speaker of the session will be Matthias Gubadiel, who will tell us about the string dual of three equal sports of three Thank you very much. <clears throat> so I'm going to try to explain a little bit how, how my work fits into this uh, collaboration and what I've been trying to do. And uh, uh, Ofa yesterday already sort of uh, indicated uh, how, how this should uh, ultimately relate to what we are trying to do. And the, so the ultimate aim is to tr try to find the description of the QD straight, Q, QCD string from a top-down approach, i.e. using a generalization of the ads CFT correspondence. And uh, as Ofa already explained yesterday, this is not entirely trivial. It's not entirely obvious how to do this. And part of the problem is that, uh, well, first of all, we understand the ads CFT correspondence uh, very well in detail, where the theory is not confining, say, n equals to four Supang mills being dual to the string theory in ADS5. And uh, so there's the first problem of how would we describe a confining background? There are ideas in supergravity, but as I'm about to explain to you, supergravity is not necessarily the right language. <coughs> and therefore, even if we look at the simple example of, of ADS5 being dual to a conformal field theory, the problem is not entirely trivial. So, so what is the, the problem for the case of ADS5? Um, the, the problem is uh, the relation between the parameters of the gauge theory and the gravity background, which uh, is uh, very well known to many of you. <clears throat> so the, the string coupling constant is uh, proportional to lambda over n, and the radius of the ADS uh, space in string units is proportional to the TUF parameter, which is uh, g squared young mills times n, which is the effective coupling constant in the large n limit. So when we are interested in sort of uh, short strings at, uh, at low, I mean, if you're interested in the perturbative description of, uh, of QCD or of n equals to four, then we may take the larger limit, but we want this tooth parameter to be small. And as a consequence, the ADS radius in string units will be small. And that is in some sense, uh, what people often call the tensionless limit, because that's the limit in which uh, in which the space has the same size as the typical size of a string. So the string is very, very large compared to the size of the space, or the space is relatively small compared to the size of the string. This is the regime that corresponds to a, a weakly coupled gauge theory, but that's not the regime you can approach in terms of supergravity and in terms of many of the techniques that have been successfully used in the ADS-CFT correspondence. So, the, 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 the key problem is that the weakly coupled planar gauge theory corresponds to the tensionless regime of the string. And that's not the regime in which we can use supergravity methods. We have to use an honest world sheet description. And an honest world sheet description for the case of ADS5 is, is difficult. That's not, uh, not currently known, not even for ADS5, let alone for any of these confining backgrounds. So why the ultimate aim is to try to to proceed with this uh, project for, for a, a true confining string, the, the first uh, aim, the maybe more, more realistic aim, is to try to find a world sheet description of weakly coupled or maybe free n equals to four super mills in four dimensions. That would be already a starting point. And then maybe from then, if we manage to understand that, then you could try to deform the theory and see what happens when you go to these other backgrounds that are not ADS. And the work I'm trying to want to explain to you is the progress we have made. So we haven't solved this problem either yet. I think we've made some inroads into this problem and we believe we are sort of maybe on the right track to solving this problem. And uh, I think the progress that we've made with n equals to four super mills has been possible because we have managed to solve a lower dimensional version fairly precisely. So while we haven't quite solved the problem of n equals to four super mills, the string theory description of n equals to four super mills, there's a lower dimensional cousin of ADS5, uh, which is ADS5 being dual to the four dimensional n equals to four super mills theory, which is the ADS3 version being dual to a two dimensional conformal field theory. And for that, and that's what I want to explain to you in some detail, we have managed to find a, a true honest world sheet description, and we have managed to test it in all sorts of details, as I'll explain to you. So this lower dimensional version doesn't relate it quite to two-dimensional young mills. The theory that uh, is, uh, is a dual to a string theory in a, because it's not conformal, the theory that's dual to a string theory in ADS3 cos S3 cos T4 is a, is a conformal field theory, a two-dimensional conformal field theory. And the collective wisdom is that this two-dimensional conformal field theory is what's called the symmetric orbifold of T4. 
So this looks very much like a free theory. It's basically n four n free bosons and four four n free fermions. And the symmetric orbifold constraint is like a global non-abelian Gauss law constraint. So it looks it has some of the features of what you would believe uh, uh, n equals to free n equals to four superang mills to be be like. But that is the correct two-dimensional version that appears in the ads CFT duality. So, so, so the, the problem we want, want to understand is what is the string theory description of exactly the symmetric orbifold theory? This is a solvable two-dimensional conformal field theory. It's effectively free. It's not entirely free because of the symmetrization constraint, but it's a theory that we have under very good control. And what we are trying to do is understand its exact world sheet description. Now, the, the reason why the lower dimensional example is easier is that there is actually a known string background construction for ADS3, unlike the case in five dimensions, because in three dimensions, you can also have fluxes, uh, a pure nervous schwartz nervous schwartz flux uh, background, and then all the complications that come with switching on Vermont Vermont flux are absent. So there is a candidate for what string theory on this side is, namely this is this uh, West Amino written model due to Maldacino Aguri originally. And this model has been known for many, many years. And one could, one could hope that somehow among these models, you will find a, a specific point. I mean, there's a, there are a number of free parameters that will correspond exactly to the symmetric orbifold of T4. This is not guaranteed. I mean, it could have been that a symmetric orbifold of T4 could have been due to a theory that involves a Ramon Vermont flux. In fact, I think that was probably the majority opinion. But if you are an optimist, you have at least one set of theories you have under control, and you should try to see whether among this set of theories, there's one that matches the symmetric orbifold. And there is a natural reason, there's a natural argument which I'll review to tell you where you have to look for the theory that has potentially a chance to be dual to the symmetric orbifold of T4. The symmetric orbifold of T4 is highly symmetrical, and somehow these symmetries must also be present here, and that tells you, roughly speaking, where you have to look. And that tells you in particular, because this is the analog of free super mills, it should be the tensionless limit. The tensionless limit, as I explained to you, means that the space is relatively small in string units. And what this means in terms of this Vesomino written model that describes the ADS3 factor is that the, the level should take the smallest possible value because the level is a measure for the size of the space in string units. So what this tells you is you should look at this theory at level one, which is the smallest possible value, and then you should simply analyze the theory and see whether it matches or not. Now, there's no guarantee that it will match because it may not be on the right branch of the moduli space, but at least that's something you can try. And this is what we did. And we actually managed to show that it matches uh, perfectly, exactly. This is to say the physical spectrum that you calculate from the string description, and I'll explain to you some feature with it, match exactly with the single particle spectrum of the symmetric orbifold. And that doesn't just involve the BPS spectrum, that involves the entire, the entire single particle spectrum of that theory. And furthermore, the correlation functions that you can calculate on the level of the symmetric orbifold, there's a certain machine that tells you how to calculate them in terms of covering map, have an exact correspondence from the perspective of the world sheet. I, we understand exactly how these, the correlation functions of this side get, can be reproduced on this side. And in the process, you realize that the theory behaves in some if sense like a topologically or effectively topological theory. It realizes this idea that the string really wants to be made up from bits because the, the, the world sheet integral, as you will see, will localize to isolated points. And you will see exactly in this toy model example, this low dimensional toy model example, how some of these ideas that Ofa was explaining yesterday are, are realized. And the hope is that this is a good, good blueprint for how this should work for ADS5. And then towards the end of my talk, I'll try to explain to you how we want to interpret that blueprint and how we believe that this may lead to a description that will also work for n equals to four super mills. Okay, so part of the, the, the magic that makes this work is that this level one theory, so this is this theory at a very small level, like many level one theories, it was mentioned earlier that uh, some of the level one theories have free field realizations in terms of free fermions. This background has a free field realization in terms of free fermions and what we call, or some people in the CFT community would call symplectic bosons. This is a beta gamma system uh, with H equals to a half. 
This is basically just a free field realization of the super Lie algebra that appears in another version of the uh, string theory description of ABS3. And uh, the fact that this is a free field theory is at the key of making this solvable. And it's probably also reflecting in some sense the high symmetry that the effectively free dual theory has. So while you would expect this world sheet theory to be complicated in some sense because it's highly curved, you may also believe that in some sense, ultimately it wants to be free. And this realizes uh, this typical picture that the highly curved theory say on the three sphere at very small <laughs> radius is at the end of the day, equivalent to a free single boson. And this is sort of the zooped up version of that. That is a very small, highly curved theory is effectively free by some quantum equivalence. And that's part of the reason why all of this works out so precisely and we can get this under so good control. Now we believe that that is one of the hints that tells us also what should happen in ADS5, although that is a uh, much more work in progress. So we believe there is a sort of a, a natural generalization of this picture that works for ADS3 cross S3 to ADS5 cross S5, where we have uh, more of these uh, fermions and symplectic bosons that then realize part of the global symmetry of N equals to four Sukang mills. There are these so-called spectrally flowed representations. In, I have decided not to explain spectrally flowed representations in detail. I'm very happy to explain them in person, but this is uh, certainly for a talk after lunch, not a good idea to try to explain this, um, but uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, so there's a natural generalization of the spectrally flowed representations. And well, there are certain aspects we haven't understood in particular, in some sense, we have a gauge fixed version of this theory, but we don't quite know how to exactly get to it by some physical state condition. But there is a relatively natural gauge fixed version. And if you follow your nose, this gauge fixed version reproduces at least the spectrum of free n equals to four super mills on the nose. So we believe the ingredients we see may very well be part of the ultimate story, although we wouldn't claim that we have understood exactly how all of that fits together. Okay, so this is basically what I want to explain to you. I, I shall spend probably a fair amount of time on ADS3 because that's what we really understand. There you see how this really works and what we believe to be the blueprint for ADS5. But obviously the real fun will be to make it work for ADS5 and that's what we are currently working on. Okay, so the, the story for ADS3 is that uh, String theory in ADS3 cross S3 cross T4, you could replace the T4 by K3, but uh, that's the backgrounds with a maximal uh, small n equals to four superconformal symmetry. They are believed to be dual to the symmetric orbifold of T4, which uh, if you think about it, is just the n copies of T4, and you quotient out by the symmetry that identifies the n copy by a permutation action. Now, when one says this, one should read the fine print. The fine print is not it's exactly that theory. It's on the same moduli space of conformal field theories that contains that point. So the picture you should have in mind is more like that. So there's a string moduli space describing different string theory on ADS3 cross S3 cross T4. And there's a moduli space of conformal field theories of which one point is the symmetric orbifold of T4 itself. But this theory has exactly marginal operators that deform the theory away. So there's a whole moduli space of these, and there's a whole moduli space of these. And what we, are, and what we believe is that the symmetric orbifold theory itself is the analog of free super mills. And the question is what exact point in the string moduli space does it correspond to? And what is the perturbative world sheet description of that point in string moduli space? So in particular, there is a special space, a special class of backgrounds here, which are described by these SL2R by Zuminovitin models. These are the backgrounds with nervous roads, nervous roads flux. And the question is, how do they exactly correspond to the symmetric orbifold theory? And the observation that made this really work was the realization that the symmetric orbifold theory has a gigantic higher spin symmetry. It has many, many conserved currents, which is very easy to see from the perspective of the symmetric orbifold. You simply take all the chiral fields and you symmetrize them. And they give you lots of single particle chiral fields. And they in fact generate what you would call a W infinity algebra in the dual CFT. So these are like the analogs of all of these conserved currents of free super mills. And that should mean it corresponds to a theory that has some sort of higher spin symmetry also in the bulk. The bulk translation of this fact means there are many, many massless higher spin fields in the bulk theory. So you would expect this to correspond to the tensionless point. And if you believe that it lands somewhere on this 
in the short sector, that should mean it should correspond to the point where the level of this theory is equal to one, the smallest possible value. Now, this theory at level one is a bit tricky if you try to de describe it directly in the Maldesino Oguri description. But fortunately, there is an alternative way of describing string theory in ADS3 versus three in terms of the so called hybrid formalism of Berkowitz, Waffer, and Witten, where the ADS3 cross S3 part get grouped together and are being described by a Wessomino Witten model based on PSU 1, 1 slash 2. And PSU 1, 1 slash 2 appears naturally because that's the global symmetry of the n equals to four superconformal theory on, on the boundary. The, the global part of the n equals to four superconformal symmetry consists of the Möbius generators forming an SL2, then the R symmetry generators forming an SU2, and then supercharges that transform in bilinears of them. And there are eight of them all together. And they precisely uh, build for you the super Lie algebra P is U1, comma one slash two. And you have this on the left and on the right. And therefore, from the world sheet perspective, if you have a theory that had this symmetry on the left, on the right, that will match naturally with the global symmetries of the dual CFT. Any case, that is what's proposed uh, to be describing string theory in ADS3 cross S3 cross T4. Um, this, is, this, this description was invented as a way of also describing theories with a background Ramon Ramon flux. But in particular, you can concentrate on the point where you haven't switched on the background Ramon Ramon flux. And then it's precisely a supergroup Bessomino Witten model based on PSU 1, 1 slash 2, together obviously with a sigma model for T4. And then there are some chiral boson fields that play the role of the ghosts that you need in order to formulate the physical state condition. And it's believed that this description is exactly equivalent to the Maldesino Oguri description. In the way I think about it is sort of the green Schwartz version of the uh, Maldesino Oguri description, which is more like the Neve Schwartz Vermont version of the theory. Now, so, so this is the theory, and this theory makes perfect sense at level one. There's nothing wrong with studying this theory at level one, but remarkable things happen at level one. So what, what is special about level one? Well, what's special about level one is that the bosonic subalgebra, so the SL2 is what I call SU1, 1 slash here is at level one, and the SU2 is at level one. That's the bosonic subalgebra of the super Lie algebra. And as uh, many of you know, if you consider SU2 at level one, then it only has two possible highest weight representation, namely the trivial representation and the spin doublet representation as the ground states of an affine of a representation of this affine Katsmudi algebra. That comes from the null vectors of this SU2 theory at level one. These are the only allowed representations. So as a consequence, you should be looking at representations of PSU1, 1, 1 slash 2 where you only get the one-dimensional and the two-dimensional representation of SU2, because these are the only ones that you can have at level one. But if you look at a generic representation of the zero-mode algebra, and by the zero-mode algebra, I mean particularly the fermionic zero-modes. So P is U1, 1, 1 slash 2 has eight fermionic zero-modes. So it has four creators and four annihilators. So if you start at the top, then there are four states down on the first line, and there are six in the middle line, four and one by recursively applying the zero modes of these fermionic generators. And since they transform in doublets with respect to SL2 and SU2, they will shift the SL2 and the SU2 representation labels up and down by a half. So the nth representation becomes n plus one or n minus one, and the spin j representation of SL2 becomes j plus a half or j minus. So that's the whole general structure of the super Lie algebra PSU 1, 1 slash 2, which should be the ground state of this highest rate representation. But as I told you, at level one, the only representations that are allowed are the singlet and the doublet. But if you stare at this picture, you see, if you start here, the generic representation will have a representation whose dimension is by two bigger than the representation at the top. So even if you start with the singlet here, you would end up with the adjoint here but the adjoint is not a possible representation for SU2 at level one. So the conclusion is the early representations of PSU1, 1, 1 slash 2 at level one are the short representations where, where this factor is absent because otherwise it's incompatible with the structure of the SU2 affine Katsumori algebra. And when you analyze this, what you find is that it's the ultra short representations that are compatible. And the only representation apart from the vacuum representation is uh, this uh, ground state representation. And furthermore, the spin of this SL2 factor gets fixed 
by the shortening condition, and it gets fixed to be exactly equal to a half. So there's really only one set of representations, well, except for this label alpha, which labels the J30 eigenvalue mod integers that uh, are possible for PSU 1, 1 slash 2 at level 1. And so, so you have this world sheet theory under very good control. It has this big algebra, and it basically has only a one parameter family of possible representations. So the, the spectrum of this theory is very much under control. You know exactly what this world sheet theory is made up of. Well, I'm, I'm lying here a little bit because in addition, you have to put in this so-called spectrally flowed sectors. But basically, this is all there is, plus all its spectrally flowed sectors. And that describes the entire world sheet theory of this, uh, of this string background describing ADS3 cos S3 at this tiny quantum uh, uh, distance where the, where the level is equal to. And for, for people who sort of know the history of this, the fact that this is a J equals to one means there's in particular no continuum of the SL2R representations. And that means that the, the long string are somehow frozen at a boundary. And that was always the reason why people believed that the pure Navish Schwartz background couldn't be dual to the symmetric orbifold. But here, the representation theory at level one fixes this to one number. And as a consequence, that argument doesn't apply. I should mention in, in passing that for, if k is bigger than one, this argument doesn't apply because then this is an allowed representation. And then you do get the continuum and you, it won't look exactly like the symmetric orbital of p4. Uh, yeah, maybe you mentioned, but uh, the spin one half for SL2R is not a unitary sure. representation. So there are some gauge constraints that would get. Sure. I mean, if, I mean, when you study SL2R, the model is to start with non unitary, but that is how it has to be because it describes the time direction in space time. So it's only after you impose the physical. So here I'm discussing the spectrum before the physical state condition has been considered. But the algebra I have before I impose the physical state condition, and this algebra already tells me that the spectrum before I impose the physical spectrum, the physical state condition is very constrained. I have a related question. Yes. The argument that SU2 has only these two representations, does that assume unitarity or not? I don't think it does. I mean, there's one way of getting this argument from unitarity, but the, the real argument I would think about, the way I think about it is that SU2 level one has a null vector at level two. I mean, the vacuum representation, the vertex operator algebra has a null vector at level two. The simple vertex operator algebra is the Verma module divided by this null vector at level two. So the representations of this structure are those where the null vector acts trivially. And the null vector at level two demands that when you have a high space state and you apply j plus twice, you always have to get zero. And that tells you the spin that must be true in any state. And therefore, the spin can be at most a half because if the spin is one, you can go down and this null vector wouldn't act null in this space. So it's a consequence of, this, of the structure of the vacuum representation of SU2. I think there are other representations of Boolean algebra, but they don't give representations of the group. So here in the W model, you expect the group PS supergroup PSU two two slash one to act in particular. The, uh, the group corresponds to the SU two issue, and I think that's what doesn't work for other representations. That's an explanation that doesn't involve unitarity. So you're saying I'm also secretly assuming that the J has to be half integer for SU two, or no? Even if it's half integer, you said that you asserted that the wrong values are wrong. But Matty asks why, without what's an explanation without using unitarity. Mm -hmm. I think I'm telling you an explanation, which is that you're in a situation where the group should act, not just the Lie algebra. Mm -hmm. The other representations of the Lie algebra with the wrong J are not what are called by people working in affine Lie algebra as integral representations. Integral means that the group acts. Right. Yeah, I think that is in some, that's, I think, similar in. To well, the argument I gave, because yeah, I think the think, argument is that it wasn't clear why the null vector has to be wrong. Because otherwise, your, Lee, your, your, your vacuum representation wouldn't be simple, right? But how do you know in this theory that it's simple since the theory isn't unitary? Mm. I think that we should consult with an expert, which I'm not. But right. I believe the answer we likely find is that the wrong representations are not explicit. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, that's certainly also true. That from the point of view of which representations of the loop group can you integrate up to the group are uh, the integrable representations, and they are also limited to be spin zero and spin a half for k equals to one. That's a, that's an explanation only using physical properties. We know in this theory you expect the group. Hmm. 
Okay, so, so, so these are the representation which this world sheet theory has, plus its spectrally flowed versions. And now you can go ahead and, uh, well, if you can go ahead and analyze the physical states just by demanding that the Maschel condition is satisfied and decoupling the degrees of freedom which the string decouples. But the smart way of doing this is to realize that the theory actually has a free field realization in terms of these free fermions and free bosons. So it's, I mean, these are funny bosons because they, they look like a spin, they are spin a half bosons, but they satisfy commutators, so they behave more like ghosts. But this is what uh, people sometimes call symplectic bosons, and the fermions are likewise satisfying the usual free fermion anti commutation relations. And what one can easily see is that these generators generate for you u1, comma 1 slash 2 at level 1. I mean, basically, the fermions give you S u2 level 1, and the symplectic bosons give you SL2. Uh, sorry, u, I mean, the, the other compact version, u1, comma 1 slash 1, and then they combine together to give you u1, comma 1 slash 2 at level 1. And then in order to get p as u1, comma 1 slash 2, you have to divide out by some sort of diagonal u1 field. That is, you have to set this field on all its descendants to zero. And that uh, describes to you precisely the representations of p as u1, comma 1 slash 2 at level 1. And in particular, the, the representation I described before is exactly the Ramon sector representation of this, uh, of this free field realization, whereas the Neve Schwartz sector representation just gives you the vacuum representation. And these are the only representations which this uh, uh, super Lie algebra has. <coughs> and then once you have this free field realization, it's relatively easy to count how many degrees of freedom you have, because you basically have four bosons, but you have to impose this, uh, this U1 constraint and then you have to impose the physical state condition. And that eats up effectively all the bosons that came from the ADS3 cos S3 factor. And you're only left over with the bosons that come from the T4. And then when you analyze exactly the physical state condition, the mass shell condition, what you see is that the masses and the charges of the spectrum that survives looks exactly like a single particle spectrum of the symmetric orbifold of T4 in the large end limit. You can simply enumerate all the states, evaluate their space-time conformal dimension, the space-time SU2 symmetry, and it matches exactly what you get or what you would get from the symmetric, uh, from the single particle spectrum of the symmetric orbifold of T4. So the, mat the spectrum matches on the nose. And then you can ask, well, what about correlation functions? Well, the symmetric orbifold theory, there's a, a nice way of calculating the correlation functions by going to the covering surface. So if you are, so I mean, here I'm talking a little bit shocked, but if you're looking at the vertex operators that live in the so-called twisted sectors of the symmetric orbifold, in particular the W twisted sectors, the way you lift it, the way you calculate these correlators is by going to some auxiliary uh, Riemann surface that, that undoes the twist of order W, and therefore the covering map that does so is a map that has uh, this structure near each of the insertion points of this vertex operator. So you can show that the so in some sense, you, you calculate these correlation functions by lifting it up to some covering surface where all the twists have gone. And then it's simply the conformal factor associated to this covering map that calculates this correlation. And the idea is that, so this was observed by Lunen and Matur, and the idea that was already suggested by Pakman, Rastelli, and Razamat is that the contribution where this auxiliary surface has genus G should come from a world sheet of genus G, and the reason they postulated this is that if you look at the one over n behavior of the correlation functions, the one over n behavior is controlled by the genus. So the contribution that comes from a specific covering map has a one over n behavior that's controlled by the genus of this auxiliary surface. And it would be produced exactly the correct uh, G string counting if this genus was the same as the world sheet of the, of the string that describes that contribution of the correlate. So, so this idea has been hanging around that somehow this, uh, this covering surfaces um, should, uh, should sort of play the role of the world sheet. But in this, this, specific, uh, in this specific world sheet here, you can, you can test this idea and you can see whether the world sheet correlators have in fact this form. And what we managed to show is that the world sheet correlators have in fact this form. They are effectively zero unless the ZIs and XIs conspire to allow for a holomorphic covering map of that kind. That's a constraint that freezes as many uh, of the string moduli as are unfrozen by the global SL2 symmetry. So once you do the integral over all the free string moduli, 
because you have all of these delta functions, you end up with the sum over all the covering maps, and therefore you end up with something that has exactly the right structure to describe a symmetric orbital correlate. Now, this is a highly unusual behavior of a world sheet correlator. Something similar was seen in earlier attempts to reconstruct the world sheet theory of free super mills. So here we expect the same, but here the remarkable thing is that this is something we can actually prove because we have this world sheet theory under so good control, we can analyze their water identities and we can show that the correlation functions have indeed this property and therefore that they behave effectively like a topological theory, despite the fact that on the face of it, they look relatively innocent. It looks like a not such unusual conformal field theory, except its correlation functions have this very, very unusual behavior which is at the heart of making the correlators match with the symmetric orbifold correlators. And we believe again, that's another of the blueprints which we should trust because that will also, a similar structure you would also expect for four dimensional n equals to four super mills. So we should imitate some aspects of that also in the four dimensional case. So, <clears throat> so this is, I, I think I've only five minutes left. So let me try to, explain how we believe that could uh, fit together for ADS5. <clears throat> now, obviously that uh, we, are, we are still struggling with that. So there are certain things that work, certain things we are not 100% sure about. We believe uh, in particular this, in this relation, which we want to think of as being some sort of incidence relation in twister spaces, meaning that the, that the fields on the world sheet, the free fields on the world sheet should be sort of twister-like. And we would also like to believe that something like spectral flow will play a role because if we have the symplectic bosons with spectral flow, we'll get something like this localization property again. So that smells like being on the right track. So the idea that uh, is then suggested in particular also by comparing with what, uh, what Berkowitz uh, proposed some years ago, I mean, he basically proposed a world sheet theory that looks exactly like the doubled up version theory of, uh, of ours, except he thought of it as, a, as an open string theory. So he imposed some boundary conditions but the spectrum before boundary conditions looks exactly like the free fields, like twice as many free fields as our ADS3 cos S3 world sheet theory. So, and, and these were twister valued fields. So that seems to sort of uh, indicate that that's maybe the right set of fields to consider. And this theory has the advantage that uh, it leads now to a PSU 2,2 slash 4 level one symmetry in the very much the same way that the previous theory led to a PSU 1,1 slash 2 level 1 theory, because these three fields generate U 2,2 slash 4 at level 1, and then there's some analog of the Z constraint that breaks this down to PSU 2,2 slash 4, and that also rings a bell with the oscillator constructions which were used in the spin chain literature to describe the spin chains of N equals to 4. So again, you feel that there should be some, some connection to what other people have tried before, and that's a it looks very similar to what happened uh, in that description. So now we believe there are the new ingredient in our spectrally flowed representations. And uh, now this is the point where we don't understand uh, exactly how this would come about, but we believe that or what we want to postulate is that if you concentrate on, on the one set of modes that are in some sense relatively naturally distinguished in these spectrally flowed sectors, and you keep one copy of them and impose some set of residual gauge conditions, then you will reproduce exactly the spectrum of three n equals to four young mills. So, so the observation is if you if you keep these modes, which are quite natural in the spectrally flowed sector, you impose the remnants of uh, what you think of as a as a mesh shell condition and then this gauge condition to decouple the overall U1, then the spectrum reproduces exactly that of three n equals to four uh, super mills in the planar limit. So in some sense, this is the answer. And the question is, how do you get to this uh, gauge fixed version from some sort of ungauge fixed version? And that is what we are not 100% sure about. It, is, uh, it works quite naturally in that uh, it looks really like string bits again, because the, 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 the various terms that you get from the spectrally <coughs> flowed sector looks like made, being made up from, by these twister valued modes, which are these modes that survive in the wedge. And they seem to match, but they match exactly with the single trace operators where you put in all the traces, all the letters from the singleton representation in, inside your trace. Now, this is sort of how we get the right spectrum. The question is, what is the ungauged fixed version? And that's where we are sort of uh, 
going back and forth to what exactly should be the right description. We are a little bit suspicious of this. I mean, originally we thought there should be eight plus eight left moving and eight plus eight right moving degrees of freedom. But then we would get a really a PSU plus PSU symmetry, which seems to be a little bit of an embarrassment of riches, maybe too much symmetry than you should have. So our current thinking is that maybe we should only start with a theory that has half as many fields, namely where half of the generators are left moving, basically the undotted indices are left moving and the dotted indices are right moving. And, but then this uh, gauge condition is somehow some sort of uh, non-chiral condition. And we are, not, we are not entirely sure whether that still makes sense within the conformal field theory or whether that's only true once you've gone to the gauge fixed description. The advantage of this is that it uh, has the, this, this, the right sort of symmetry to correspond to, if you think about going down to ADS3 cross S3, there you're going to get a PSU 1 comma 1 slash 2 plus PSU 1 comma 1 slash 2 symmetry, which sits naturally inside, well, almost naturally inside PSU 2 comma 2 slash 4. And here you would get sort of separately left moving and right moving symmetries combining into this global symmetry but you would retain the global PSU 2 comma 2 slash 4 symmetry in the world sheet, but not an affine PSU 2 comma 2 slash 4 symmetry. There are other things that go for this. So in particular, you would have only as many degrees of freedom, roughly speaking, as for ADS3 cross S3. So the old physical state condition could apply. And more recently, we have realized that with this picture, there are a natural guess for what the BMN operators would be. And the BMN operators would have the right dispersion relation to match with what you would expect to appear in the tensionless limit of BMN. So we do believe there is something right about this idea, but we are not exactly sure how this comes uh, about from first principles. So this is very much a work in progress. So since my time is up, let me uh, summarize. I think we have got a very good understanding of ADS3 plus S3. This is a a detailed example where we really understand both sides exactly. We think we should use this blue this as a blueprint to understand what happens for ADS5. The question is which are the correct things to generalize and which are specific to ADS3. We've suggested one natural generalization that reproduces at least on the face of it the correct spectrum, but there may there's probably not everything is exactly right about it. And then there are many <clears throat> future directions. So we are trying to understand the federation away from the free case. First for the ADS3 case, we're looking at finite N effects. Uh, then we can, one can ask, maybe one can do something similar for free young mills, free two-dimensional young mills. I mean, the structure is somewhat similar. So can we maybe be inspired and guess the honest world sheet answer for that theory? That would obviously be, be interesting. That may be another hint about what's the correct generalizations to four dimensions. And then in the four dimensional case, uh, what exactly is this ADS5 world sheet theory? Obviously, once we've understood it, then we can try to perturb it, study its correlation functions. There's some intriguing relation to this twisted holography of, uh, of Castello and Gaiotto. They, they seem to have some ADS3 subsector, and they seem to see this uh, chiral algebra. But this chiral algebra if you has effectively a free field realization in terms of the same sort of fields that appear on our world sheet description. So you would hope that somehow that can get connected together. And there's a way of putting this all together. And then obviously there are many, many dots. And then at the very bottom, hopefully, eventually, we can also learn something about the QCD string along these lines. So thank you for your attention. I didn't understand how to get a global PSU 224 where some symmetries are left when and some are right wing. Could you recapitulate that? Well, so so the idea is that you have if you write down the algebra in terms of modes, then if you calculate the commutation relations, you don't really care whether the modes are left moving and right moving. So you can write down, so when I said that this leads to uh, say uh, PSU 2 comma 2 slash 4. Uh, one way of doing this is writing down the affine generators of PSU 2 comma 2 slash 4 in terms of sums of modes of these various fields. But in order to calculate the commutation relations, you only need the commutation relations. And it would also work if some of the modes were left moving and some of the modes were right moving. They, they wouldn't be the, the modes of some local current. But for the zero modes, I think one could believe that they could still arise as some suitably defined uh, integral of of something, but certainly on the level of an of an algebraic relation, you can generate a PSU two comma two slash four algebra. So 
some of your currents are homomorphic and some are anti-homomorphic. Right. So, so I mean, if you have so so all the all the bilinears you can well actually the question so all the bilinears you can make out of here would be holomorphic all the bilinears you can make out of here would be anti-holomorphic the bilinears that involve one field from here and one field from here wouldn't be quite holomorphic nor anti-holomorphic they wouldn't be conserved currents they wouldn't be conserved currents but i can write down it, it depends a little bit exactly what the what the physical state condition is but i can write down the combination of left and right moving modes that would commute with L0 plus L0 bar. And if L0 plus L0 bar is the correct physical state condition, that would map physical states to physical states. Certainly the BMN generators cannot be purely chiral. I mean, we know from the dispersion relation, they have to be somehow not purely chiral. And so we, we know we, we somehow have to combine left and right moving degrees of freedom. But um, we believe at least the global symmetry would still make sense. Is there any <clears throat> relation between going back to ADS3? Is there any relation between these three fields and the Wakimoto representation? Uh, there, there is. There is. I mean, it's not. It's not entirely trivial. But uh, you, you can you can write the uh, you can write the Wakimoto fields also in terms of these three fields. Yes. The reason I ask is the Wakimoto fields have an can be used also for other values of k. If I'm not mistaken. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so this will only work at k equals to one. I mean, but what I'm saying is that k equals to one, you can write the. I mean, because you can write the currents in terms of these, you can reconstruct the Wakimoto fields in terms of these. So, is it the case that these fields are not exactly the same as the Wakimoto? No, they're not exactly the same. But, but you can express the Wakimoto fields because you can express the currents and then you can translate it into the Wakimoto fields also in terms of these three fields, but you can't directly. Okay, sorry about this again. <laughs>